Now I have the very great pleasure of introducing you to our speaker, Mark Dennis, curator at the Museum of Freemasonry. And Mark will give us a talk about some very interesting portraits featured on jewelry from the collection. And Mark, we are very excited about this. I will hand over to you. Thank you, Jay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, Freemasons love to wear badges, which they call jewels. They're easily the most numerous things in our collections. We've got over 10,000. In fact, if our collections manager were here, she'd probably say even more than that. You could make any number of talks out of that jewel collection, which is international and includes all the various Masonic orders. Tonight, we're going to look at a very, very specific, specific niche, jewels that have portraits on them. And also, by the by, look at some portraits that show some very interesting jewels. If you're a Freemason watching this, you already know quite a bit about jewels, but there will be people watching who aren't Freemason, so I hope you'll excuse me if I give them a little bit of context. When Freemasonry got going in the early 1700s, it grouped men together to give them a shared experience and a bond, and they met in what were termed lodges, which was a name taken from the temporary structures built next to cathedrals and used by the stonemasons. In 1717, some of them came together to form a Grand Lodge. And from that point onwards, Freemasonry had a structure and an organization. From the very earliest period, they used things to show their membership and to illustrate their ceremonies. Stonemasons' aprons, stonemasons' tools. But very rapidly, they turned into the jewels of Freemasonry. And there's one of the earliest pictures of Freemasons known from a chart um, done by a man called Picard in the 1730s. And you can see they're wearing stonemasons aprons, they've got stonemasons tools, but the man in the middle is also wearing one of the earliest jewels. They've converted stonemasons tools into badges of office. And at this very early period, most of the jewels are about being a Freemason and being proud of being a Freemason or showing the role that you've got in Freemasonry. And I've shown just a range of very early jewels at the top to give you an idea of how diverse they looked. On the left is the jewel of William Virgo, and he was a Freemason. You can see the cubic stone, the square, the compasses, but he was also the secretary of the lodge, so you get the quill pens that he would have used to write the minutes. Or in the middle, that jewel shows the plans of King Solomon's temple, being presented to the king, or on the right, Greek allegory. But these were always about Freemasonry. Most Freemasons socialized particularly inside their own lodges with their own friends. They beat other Freemasons, they'd go to Grand Lodge. But it was their own lodge that mattered to them most. And those lodges very rapidly got an identity. In the chart that you can see behind the Freemasons there, you can see the names of all the pubs, the taverns, the coffee houses where they met, and which very often gave them their names. Grenadiers Lodge sounds very military, but it was actually the Grenadiers Pub. It didn't take very long before they wanted to show the identity of their lodges and their friends in a much more material way. That's probably the earliest portrait of a Freemason anywhere. Um, Colonel Pitt, he's what's called a Grand Steward, and these were a group of Freemasons who would give an annual feast to the Grand Master. He's wearing round his neck a jewel that was created purely for the Grand Stewards, and it shows the square, the badge of the Master, the level, and the plumb line, the badge of his management team, the Wardens. And traditionally, it's believed that the artist and engraver William Hogarth created that design. There's no proof. But Hogarth was a grand steward, so perhaps. If you look at the portrait, you can see everything's very simple. It's hung off a, a simple cloth collar, the mallet, the gauntlets, the tools, they're all real. He could be a stonemason, except he happens to be rather important, and he really isn't. He was painted in the early 1730s. You only have to jump 30 years forward for the world to look very different. There's Anthony Tembroke. He's master of Caledonian Lodge, and you can see the difference. His apron, it's silk, it's purely symbolic. His master's square, 
it's from an amazing column of Portuguese silver, which still exists, and it's on display in the museum, courtesy of Caledonian Lodge. But tonight, we're looking at his neck. He's wearing a badge, a jewel, that shows he's been master of the lodge once before. And there it is, the actual one on the right. And we've got more than one in the collection to different members of Caledonian Lodge. So what you can see is by the 1760s, lodges are giving their masters individual jewels to wear that are particular to their lodge, not to Grand Lodge or Freemasonry as a whole. And it's the beginning of lodges having a true identity. Over the history of United Grand Lodge, there have been nearly 10,000 individual lodges. Each has a name, each has a number, and each has an image now that's associated with it. And that's where we come to our portraits on jewels. Because once you've got an identity, you might name yourself after someone. And there are some of the people you might name yourselves after. The other thing you'll notice, these are founders jewels, because by the 1860s, jewel wearing was very, very popular and the founders of lodges wanted to wear something. So they started. Rudyard Kipling, famous Freemason, author, poet, fair enough. But the next one in isn't a Freemason, Andrew Marvel. He was a metaphysical poet, politician, satirist, but he was around in the 1600s, far too early to be in a proper Masonic lodge. So why is he on the jewel? Well, the answer is he went to school in Hull and it's a lodge from Hull. Um, it still meets. On the right, we've mentioned Hogarth and there he is um, in his artist's cap. And that's copied from a print of him because again, you have to have a way of getting these images and they're mostly taken from photographs, from portraits, from prints, or sometimes they're just invented. The jewel second from right is the one on the title slide of the talk. And it's a classic case of you have to go to the objects because if you saw a reference to Agnus Lodge, which is Latin for the lamb, you might think it was Lamb of God. Maybe it's a butcher's lodge, shepherds. It's a pun. The man's name is Charles Lamb and he's a diarist. But you'd only find that out if you actually looked at the jewel itself. Lodges named after people don't always show a portrait. In Britain particularly, a lot of important people have coats of arms. And so you very often find a shield with supporters instead of a picture. You more often find pictures when they're famous people from history um, and you don't want to use the coat of arms. Some of the most famous people, of course, are members of the royal family. These are the only women I feature tonight uh, because we're looking at um, jewels from United Grand Lodge. But there on the left is Queen Victoria in the jewel that was given to all Freemasons who were members at the time of her Diamond Jubilee. And she's the mother of the Grand Master, the future Edward VII, so that makes sense. But then on the right, you have a lodge jewel, Rose of Denmark, named after Queen Alexandra, uh, the Grand Master's wife. And there, they've rather shrewdly taken the Jubilee jewel most of the parts of which already existed at the manufacturers, and they've applied in the middle of it a photograph of the Queen. So you do find not just non-Masons, but women um, and other characters on these jewels. Edward VII as Grand Master, of course, uh, one of the most famous characters in all of Freemasonry, and on the left, there's his own portrait on his own jewel um, in gold and diamonds for his installation as Grand Master. Interestingly enough, he very rarely seems to have worn it. He was not a vain man, um, a very sociable. So I do wonder if he chose not to have pictures of himself when he was wearing it. Um, there's a bit of a parallel, I think, with the um, Franz Joseph, the Emperor of Austria, who, when he wore his medals, always wore them back to front. So you didn't have to look at about 15 versions of him as you were approaching. Many members of the royal family have been Freemasons. And up until now, we've been looking at jewels for occasions, but Freemasons give vast amounts of money to charity. And that's done through festivals. And if you give a sum of money to a festival, you can become a steward. And stewards are allowed to wear a breast jewel for their year of office. 
they don't have pictures on them normally. But there are always exceptions. The Royal Masonic Benevolent Institution ran the old folks homes, care for the elderly. And in 1897, the future Grand Master, the Duke of Connaught, there on the right, um, was the president of the appeal. And everybody who became a steward got a jewel that was actually a locket. And when you opened it, you had photographs of the Duke of Connaught and his mother, Queen Victoria. And when we were doing an exhibition a year or so ago um, about jewels, we thought it would be nice to show his jewel. And we opened up and were very startled to find they weren't photographs, they were enamel paintings and beautifully done. Freemasons are equal, equal brothers, but if you're the son of the queen, you might just get something a little bit better than everybody else. Um, Connaught himself, as you look at him, is, is wearing his collar as a provincial grand master, a regional ruler in Freemasonry, but also uh, for some of the overseas grand lodges where he had honorary rank. So that's a reminder of some grand lodges, particularly in Germany, that, that no longer exist. I mentioned you don't have to be a Freemason to appear on Freemason's jewels. Here are four different lodges, all of which were formed in 1935, which was the Silver Jubilee of King George V. His dad had been a Freemason, his sons would be, but he did, he didn't join. Nonetheless, all the lodges in that year decided to celebrate the Jubilee. So Jubilee Lodge has the king. Commemoration Lodge has the king and the queen. Silver Jubilee Lodge has the king and the queen, and on and on. Um, just one jewel in our entire collections shows a certain amount of brilliant imagination because the other Jubilee Lodge to the right shows the crowds cheering the king and queen on the balcony of Buckingham Palace, which is just rather a nice touch. Around about the 1880s, something new happens in portraits on jewels. We start to see more ordinary Freemasons appearing. And one of the reasons I think is that someone had obviously devised a way of bonding photographs onto the jewels. So it was obviously much, much easier to do and much less expensive. Um, the two on the left are done that way. Uh, Noel Money Lodge um, actually has a paper printed um, picture embedded in the jewel. Only on the right, Albert Coveney Lodge, is it actually enamelled. Um, Albert Coveney was by all accounts a thoroughly nice chap. He was a manager of the Birkenhead Brewery Company, which will endear him to many listening. He was an active contributor to charity. He served as chairman of benevolence for Cheshire. He joined lodges, founded lodges. And obviously his friends thought a very great deal of him because they founded a lodge in his honor while he was still alive and presented him a jewel with his own portrait on, which is just rather lovely. Um, on the far left, Thomas Proctor, um, he was a very senior Freemason, Assistant Grand Director of Ceremonies, which is a, an important role at Grand Lodge. He was in livery companies in the City of London. He was in the Stock Exchange, a Justice of the Peace. But he was actually very much concerned with abstinence and temperance, not drinking alcohol. And Thomas Proctor Lodge, as formed, was a temperance lodge, and that's why they picked him not for all his other achievements, but for his, his moral standing in not, not drinking. Murdoch Lodge, well, that presented me with an interesting question. Um, Murdoch did lots of things. He worked for James Watt and Matthew Bolton. He popularized gaslighting. He invented steam engines. And he worked a lot in Birmingham, and it's a Birmingham Lodge. So far, so good. So how's there a color photograph of the guy? He died before photography. And that took a bit of finding out, but eventually um, it turns out that at the National Wallace Memorial Monument in Scotland, there's a row of marble busts of Scottish heroes, including Murdoch. So what they did was they took a photograph of the marble bust and then tinted it like a photograph. Good bit of lateral thinking there, I'd say. All of these jewels are made by commercial people. Um, it's it's a trade-off between what the lodge can afford, its ideas, and what the manufacturers can make. But there are a number of jewels which are actually converted from other items. Anyone listening who knows anything about jewels will recognize the so-called Sackville jewel on the left. It's an, a fine art medal that was made to commemorate um, an English lord 
becoming a member of an English lodge in Florence in Italy in 1732. There is on the front, Masonic symbolism on the back. It was never intended to be worn. It was meant to be a touch piece, put in the drawer, have as a souvenir. But I have never seen one that hasn't been adapted for wear, either with a hole bored straight through it. Fantastic. How to ruin an antique. But what you probably can't see on the bottom one, if you look very close, you can see the scratches where a clasp's been fitted. And I've never seen one yet where the person just said, oh, that's nice, and put it in their drawer. A much more example of the same idea is that of the consecrating master of Organon Lodge. Now, Organon, what's one of those? It's the work um, published um, by um, Christian Friedrich Samuel Hahnemann, who pretty much invented homeopathy. And that was his great work. And the medal at the bottom shows him. Um, it's based on a portrait bust by David of Janger. And it already existed. The man who made it was a man called E. Gillick. He was uh, a medalist. He produced actual medals for the crown. And the lodge has simply married that up to make a jewel. And in that way, quite inexpensively, get a really good representation of, of the founder. Um, Gillick himself, though he wasn't a mason when he made it, did later join the Arts Lodge. Um, so there's another rather nice link. Many, many lodges do recycle material like this um, in other ways. And there's another interesting exception to the rule, because again, it's an art medal effectively, with a portrait, but it's been properly cast and always intended to be in a jewel. Um, this is a man called George Blackall Simmons, and he was master of the Arts Lodge. And each year, they cast a new one of these jewels for the new master, changing the year every single time. It was cast by possibly Alessandro Parlanti, who was a fine art medals caster, and then sent over to a Masonic firm, H.T. Lamb, to put on the ribbon, put on the top bar with the enamel. If you come to the museum in 2021, you'll be able to see it for real because it's going to feature in our upcoming exhibition about um, arts and crafts movement, Art Deco and Art Nouveau in Freemasonry. So far, we've only talked about English lodges, pretty much. Gone over the border slightly with one or two of the characters. Um, but our collections do have vast numbers of jewels from other constitutions of Freemasonry in other countries. And many of them, particularly in Germany, in Central Europe, they're cast medals, even to this day. I'll show you just one example. Uh, this is the jewel for the Lodge Comenius in exile. Um, Comenius was a Czech philosopher and theologian who's often thought of as one of the fathers of modern education. This lodge was in exile from the Nazis during the Second World War, hence having St Paul's at the height of the Blitz on the back of this jewel. It was quite a commitment to use this much metal when English Freemasons were actually giving up their jewels to smelt for the war effort. But it was a strong statement that Freemasonry would return to the Czech Republic, and it did. Uh, we've got a lovely letter in the archives from 1946, and they've crossed out their London address and just put Prague. Um, so this again is, is one of our, tr our treasures in the museum because it shows Freemasons in adversity. Um, they were of course again shut down by communists, but they're back. Um, the Czechs love their Freemasonry. I'll do just one more um, overseas thing. These are American. Um, many Grand Lodges in America have a tradition of commemorative medals or coins bearing the image of their Grand Masters, who are very often annually elected. And they also use many portraits of historic figures. And I think that's partly because they don't have a college of arms. You can't have a coat of arms. You have to show the person. Uh, I think this gives you some idea of the variability of quality. Um, it goes everywhere from wonderful to bad taxidermy, frankly, but it does at least mean that people who otherwise might not be remembered can be seen in the jewels. They'll be around for hundreds of years, perhaps, and these men will be remembered um, as a result of it. A slight change of tack. Mostly we've been talking about the jewels themselves, but I'd like to finish by um, looking at um, the stories jewels can tell, and also portraits. Um, up until the Second World War, and to a lesser extent after it, Freemasons wore every jewel they were entitled to. 
if they got a promotion, they hung it on their chest, put it on their neck. Um, so these are amazing ways through photographs and portraits of knowing who the man was. Because by seeing the jewels, you will understand what lodges he was in, which might tell you where he was, the things he was interested in, his religious affiliation even. What charities did he support? So you can read him like a book. Um, Harry Bladen, who was a jewel manufacturer, made the classic group on the left, which has over 70 jewels in it. The group in the middle was a Freemason who was in Africa, in English and Scottish lodges. And on the right, a man who was present in the Royal Albert Hall for the Golden Jubilee of Queen Victoria, gave charity, was in many different Masonic orders. So jewels tell you about the man. Jews let you understand. And one of the sadnesses now is very often jewels don't appear in portraits. Um, the Earl of Euston on the right, splendid chap. That's the way a historian wants to see jewels worn because every single thing, Grandmaster of the Mark Masons, every single thing he's got is there. Um, and you can read him like a book. Whereas Lord Latham, as program master of UGLE on the left, he's in his peers' robes. But if you look very closely on the table, you can see his neck jewel, and I've put an enlargement in the corner. And modern portraits very often have the rank jewel somewhere, but the person's in civilian clothes and in a suit. I'd like to wrap up by just a little case study. Two men, two jewels, and um, two portraits. This is a jewel on the left of Floriat Lodge. Doesn't give you many clues what it's all about. But on the ribbon is the portrait of an elderly gentleman with the words grandpere, grandma, grandfather. And there he is in the middle. Muggeridge, old mug, who was a particular supporter of one particular way of doing Masonic ceremonies and a very much loved Freemason. He in a way was the father of his own lodge, which was named after him, but didn't show him on its jewel. But that lodge created another, which in Freemason terms is a granddaughter, is a, is a daughter lodge. So in a way he was the granddad of Floriat Lodge. And through the daughter lodges, his portrait, his face continues to be remembered. And in the collections, we have a, a number of things of his, including the shaky handwritten speech from the last time he ever appeared in a Masonic lodge by then in his eighties. So there's William Muggeridge, old mug. And there's another portrait. Now this is Peter Thompson. I love that portrait. It's one of the best faces in the entire collection. And on the left of him, as you look, you're seeing that jewel, which I've pictured here. Size of a dinner plate, amazing thing, given to him in 1819. Why is he relevant? Well, he's the man who proposed William Muggeridge should become a Freemason. And you can imagine that when young William, in his 20s, came into Lodge and saw his friends for the first time, he would have looked for his proposer, he'd have looked for Peter, and he would have seen that jewel. So between that and the Floriat Lodge, we've got the first thing that Muggeridge ever saw in Freemasonry, and a jewel that ensures his memory is preserved. So jewels can be many, many different things. They can tell stories, they can show us places and people that no longer exist, and they're a fascinating thing to study. We've probably at the Museum of Freemasonry got one of the best collections anywhere, um, but some of the other accredited Masonic museums, particularly in Kent and Worcester, Warrington, um, Norwich and elsewhere have collections. They do exist in places like the British Museum, in other museums, but they tend not to show them. They're not quite sure what to do with them. Um, people who collect them have a passion, and I hope if you happen to be here, not because you've got a passion in jewels, but you're just curious that you'll go exploring on our catalogue where we've got images of all the um, lodge jewels up to beyond the First World War and also for the whole of London. There's a lot to discover and I'm sure there'll be many more talks on jewels to come. Thank you. <laughs> well done, Mark. That was brilliant. Very good talk. <laughs> and stop share. And and we've got more participants that we started with, which has got to be good. Oh, that don't keep an eye on that, you. <laughs>
You should keep an eye on the questions. That's what I'm doing because we are right. already getting questions in. Thank you so much. If you have a question for Mark, please um, post it in the chat. It would be lovely to hear from you. Well done, Mark. That was really interesting. Uh, we already got some questions, so I think we just jump right into it, if that's okay. Oh, that's fine. Can you please explain the origin of the Hall Cross Jewel, please? Hall Cross? I think you may mean the Hall Stone Jewel. Um, if we, if we instantly get a no, I don't mean that. Stop me. Yeah. Um, the Hallstone Jewel um, was a fundraising means when Freemasons Hall was to be created as the Masonic Peace Memorial between the wars. Um, it was designed by uh, a man called Spackman, who also did other jewels and was a Mason. It was intended to represent the Angel of Peace holding a temple with the dates of the war. Um, although, and it's generally reckoned to be the Peace Angel or the Hallstone Angel. It came in a number of varieties, um, 10 guineas, 10 pounds, 10 shillings, silver, 100 gold, uh, an average of 10 guineas per man in your lodge, then it, silver gilt and you get to wear it forever as master, um, and just three provinces and districts, Buckinghamshire, Japan and Burma got to wear theirs. Uh, the design is the same on all of them, it's only the finish that varies. Um, so if that answered it, great. If not, follow-up yeah. question, please. Fantastic. Um, Mark, uh, what is the earliest example of a founder's jewel? What, what date and which lodge? I'd have to look up which lodge, but it's mid-Victorian. They really don't start get going until the 1860s. Um, about the same time as the special centenaries are going, which I think is early 60s, possibly even into, into 50s, uh, you see a sudden explosion. There's no sense of founders' jewels. They happen. Centenary jewels happen. Um, the charities go from wearing embroidered favours at feasts to having metal jewels. And it all happens really from 1860 to 1880. Um, the other thing, which I've never worked out why, is founders and past masters' jewels are very, very sort of samey in the 60s and 70s. And suddenly they come out with all these wonderful designs and pictures. And whether that's a manufacturing thing, I'm not sure. Never have worked that one out. Uh -huh. Uh, I got a question now, Mark. I think it's referring to the the last slide you showed us. Um, it says, what does the little hammer signify? I think that's the little hammer on that final slide you had. Um, oh, that's a gavel. Um, he's portrayed as the master of the lodge. So he's able to gavel to make up a, a noise to bring the, the, bring the, the meeting to order. Um, Freemasons use gavels. And if you go to a, a, a Masonic meal, um, you'll get the three gavels going around the table, uh, the master and the wardens. Ah, very good, very good. Uh, here's an interesting one, Mark. What is the most valuable jewel in the museum collection and why? Ooh. See, the trouble is, if you saw my last talk, you'd know I think the most valuable one is the, the almond's jewel made out of an old bit of old aluminium from Changi because of the story it tells. Um, and I think very often what is valuable about them is the moral they point. Um, physically valuable, it's probably one of Edward VII's. Um, they're very, very, very shiny. Um, uh, but again, we have the advantages as curators, provided we look after things, we don't have to worry about the value. It's the stories they tell, um, what we can make them say to people. Mm -hmm. It's a nice place to be in. Mark, is there a publication showing all the large foundation jewels? No, there isn't. Uh, it would be one hell of a book and I'd probably buy it actually. Um, we are looking at all sorts of ways of digitizing the remaining jewels. We've got up to beyond the First World War. So in the catalogue, you can get to see them all, um, but there's no images of one subsequent to that. It would be a big job and well worth doing. But um, if there's a, again, as I said last time, if there's a publisher out there fancies publishing that, you know where we are. Well, really interesting. Um, um, because no, I mean, I, I think it's, they're, they're fast, fascinating things to study. Um, one of my previous colleagues did a, a study of Lodge founding jewels across the period of the Second World War. And you can see sort of vaguely patriotic until we lose at Dunkirk. And then it's all country churches and villages. There's even one for the Observer Corps. And instead of having somebody in a tin hat looking for the Luftwaffe, it's, um, it's a Tudor sailor with his dog looking for the Spanish Armada. So it's all, yeah, we'll just forget about this war. And then you get to D-Day and it comes back and it's more about peace and it's more about the future. So, you know, from just looking at the pictures, you get so many stories. Um, 
it's a bit you've got to look at the jewels you can't just look at the words yeah um true good point good point um, oh and by the way i've just been looking at the chat and you're quite right tapton hall in sheffield has an excellent collection of jewels i stand i stand corrected but at this rate i'm going to need a bingo card remembering every single museum in the country but well that is very true well um, done dr joel quite right too <laughs> My, I was wondering because you you talked you talk really about visual identity here, yeah. and I was wondering uh, why were jewels specifically used as symbols of visual identity? Can you tell a bit about that? It comes, I think, it comes from the medalist tradition, um, because the Sackville Medal, um, which was made in Florence, interestingly, all medals made in Florence and, and Rome at the time had to be approved by one of the Vatican officials. Um, which, given the Vatican had a rather uneasy relationship with English Freemasonry at the time, was interesting. But these were very much identity pieces, personal identity, people's faces, people who they were. And that kind of expanded into the idea that this group, each group of people had its own identity and that that could be expressed visually. It, it happened gradually. Um, but if you think all the membership badges for clubs and societies now, everybody does it. We all wear badges for something. Um, and you know, the Freemasons way of doing it is one of the earliest examples of that, that if you belong to something, why not show you're proud of it and wear something? Um, and also, I, I know that people wearing their, their jewels, it was a conversation starter. If you were visiting friends in another lodge, well, what's that about? And it would, it would break, break the ice quite successfully. Yeah, true. Good point. How many jewels are there in the museum collection, Mark? Over 10,000. Oh, easily over 10,000 um, because again we've got by no means all of the, the jewels for English um, craft lodges we've got a very long run for a ceremony called the Royal Arch we've got all the additional ceremonies we've got overseas including grand lodges that don't exist um, and then we've got stuff for friendly and fraternal and other sort of fraternal societies like odd fellows buffaloes that aren't Masonic but we've got some of their stuff so it's, it's an immensely diverse collection um, and very much understudied um, I yeah. wish I could get more researchers. I mean, I know there are people passionate about it, but I wish I could get more external researchers to come and see just how important this is. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Mark, another question for you in the chat. Do you have a section on the Second World War cardboard jewels? We have all of them. Um, they're not on display at the moment. They were traditionally always out, um, produced mainly for the charities, but also for individual lodges. Um, I mean, the whole question of how people dealt with the lack of metal to make jewels during the Second World War is, is interesting in itself. There's even a past master's jewel where they've actually filed off the side of a penny and engraved it um, as an economy measure. So we do have them um, and they're one of the treasures I think of most Masonic museums, you know, making the point that you, you've got to economise but you keep going. It's the same as plastic jewels during the war, um, just the same as you know, the, the army was going on to plastic to avoid using metal that could frankly be used to make bullets. Very good. Um, are there any jewels made up by Freemasons in prisoners of war camps, particularly during the Second World War? Uh, well, as I said in one other talk, the, um, the ones from the internee camp in Changi in Singapore um, are the great ones. Um, we do have prisoner of war jewels, particularly for the First World War. Um, there don't seem to be too many. There's working tools, there's actually the tools for the ceremonies, but fewer jewels, I think, in, in the Second World War because more difficult to be a Freemason when there's Nazis hanging around. You know, if they catch you, it's going to end very badly. So mm -hmm. I, I've heard a legend, and I can't remember my source, that some of the POW um, lodges in the Second World War did have jewels, but they were cardboard and they tore them up. But I can't remember who said that, and I doubt they're listening in, so just don't quote that in a doctorate, anybody. It might be wrong. <laughs> Um, Mark, you, you mentioned there um, a homeopathy lodge. Uh, uh, that's a bit of a strange one. Could you tell us more about that? Oh, Organon. Yes, it was formed uh, with the intention that people who practice homeopathy, you know, the idea of diluting things until you can't see they're there and then treating people for medical conditions. Um, originally, you had to be an enthusiast um, for homeopathy or an actual practitioner to join it. Um, it has to be said they, they ran out of them eventually. Uh, and before the lodge closed, um, you know, they were just normal, normal Freemasons. Um, their motto was rather fun, Sapere Audi, um, which literally translates dare to know. Um, but at their first foundation meeting, the, um, the chaplain said, it's 
it means having the courage of your opinions because homeopathy was as controversial then as it is now. Um, so one imagines it must have been a fascinating lodge to be part of. Indeed, very good. <laughs> um, let me just see. Um, Mark, I know this is probably a, a whole talk in itself, but uh, can you say a bit more about the visual difference between British and overseas jewellery? Uh, did they represent something different? Yes, it's a very different tradition. Um, one of the things about this, many continental European lodges particularly have members jewels. That when you join, you get a jewel that you know, you're identified with your lodge. You don't have to have founded it or been the master. So that is different. Um, particularly um, in Germany and across Central Europe, they're very sculptural. Um, if you think of sort of slightly sort of Soviet Russia style, very angular, very medal medallic in, in tradition. Um, in uh, Germany, there's a, a women's grand lodge. And again, they're very sculptural. They've got moonstones and things added to them. But it's, it's very different. In England, we've got um, the manufacturers and they're very good at painting on enamel. They're very good at making dies and standard bits and pieces that you can match together to make something. Um, and you do find that where we've in, we, United Grand Lodge has influenced um, development, like the um, Grand Lodge National Francaise, the jewels are very English in style. I mean, totally French in design, but you change the language and the tricklers, they'd merge. But um, certainly pre-First World War and Second World War in Germany, there's nothing there that you would, you would think of as English. Um, and Czech Republic again, um, Alphonse Mucha, they're very, very Art Nouveau in style. Right. There's no reason that ours couldn't have been, but they weren't. So you're, so you're seeing national identity coming through, you're seeing Masonic identity coming through. Um, and again, of course, on the continent, many of these, these lodges would have been involved in the longer um, sets of ceremonies. So there's a lot more symbolism to be playing around with. Mm. Well, very interesting. Um, Mark, time is running, but I just want to ask here towards the end, is there anything else you want to mention about the jewels in the collection that you didn't have time for in your talk today? Not really, but just <laughs> come and research them, please. Um, they, they sit in their drawers. They're waiting for you all to come and look at them. Um, they will always come out again for exhibitions. Every single exhibition we run will have some jewels in it. Um, but as our strategy goes forward, the chance of seeing thousands of jewels in one place is diminishing. But you show enthusiasm and tell me what you want to look at. I'll be only too delighted to get them out for you and learn from you because that's the joy of this job. True. You, between true. you, you know a lot more than I do. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark. What a brilliant point. We are running out of time. Uh, a huge thank you to Mark for a fantastic talk and thank you to Louise for technical support. And also, of course, thank you to all of you for joining us and for your questions. This was the last live talk in this series of live video talks with the Museum of Freemasonry. We hope you have enjoyed diving into our interesting history and collection with us. We have been very happy to have you all with us. So thank you so much for lots of questions and kind feedback. We do read it all and we save it and we truly appreciate it. You can view all the talks again on our website and please also remember to sign up for our newsletter. We hope to be back at another time with more live talks and stories from our fascinating history. For now, thank you so much for joining us and have a nice evening.